For many years, I was a park ranger. The most memorable thing that happened to me was in 1986. If you lived through the era, you don't need me to describe it for you. And if you didn't, you've probably gotten a sense of what it was like through movies, music, and TV. There was a vividness in the air that was unlike anything else. On my days off, I was always seeing movies now regarded as classics of the era. Most of the rangers did that on their days off, and after a shift, it wasn't uncommon for us to go to the local mall and hang out in the food court. Since then, the mall has been demolished after years of decline, but I still have the memories. And even if we did have work, we still had plenty of fun. Every Friday night, we would check out the latest movies released at the local video store. Because we would take our selections to the ranger station that served as our office, pop them in the VCR, and spend the rest of the shift watching our selections. This was before cell phones, when a movie being released on video was a big deal, and before there was the endless choices of TV or entertainment you have today. So being able to watch movies on the job with my fellow rangers was an event. Some of the best memories I have of my job as a park ranger, and of the era in general, were movie nights at the ranger station. But of course, sometimes reality can be stranger than any movie. The week it all started, it had been raining on and off for a few days before, so we spent most of our shifts in the ranger station. I was working the day shift on that particular afternoon. It was late spring, and the air in that area near the mountains was crisp and fresh. So refreshing, it almost feels unnatural, but even the air is nothing compared to the view. You don't see it so much as you feel it. It's an experience. But then nature often is. Many times I had moments that felt more like a vivid dream than a day at work. The pine trees were so lush, green, and vibrant that they stuck out vividly against the bright blue sky and the crisp white clouds. The thick outer layer of pine trees surrounding the park sloped down at a perfect angle, and there were enough trees that you could smell the scent of pine, even if you weren't incredibly close, which was fine by me. I've always loved the refreshing smell of pine. I also love seeing the tops of the trees swaying when it's windy, and driving down the hills and slopes of the park with the windows open in the middle of summer is absolutely magnificent. To make matters even better, the grass had just been mowed and the smell hung in the air. The grass itself had been cut in rows that were so precise you could trace them all the way to the park's fence. I'd seen it done a thousand times, and the effect was always so crisp and neat, regardless of what trees, flowers, benches, or buildings were nearby. I knew the park employees who did it, and never failed to be impressed by their work. But that's the thing about nature. Even the parts of it we can have some influence over never fails to be a sight to see. As I was walking past a cluster of picnic benches, I briefly looked to the left and saw something sitting there on the ground in front of the area. It was a plastic mask someone might wear as part of a Halloween costume, lying discarded on the grass like it had been forgotten. I stood there unsure of what exactly to think. Was this some kind of a joke, or was this all deliberate? Back then, it seemed much more likely that something was a joke or an accident, because in order to film something, you needed an actual camera to do it. So I was leaning towards a joke, but if this was a joke, then who was it being played on? The mask was one of those that covers your entire head. With its fangs and other features, I guessed this one was supposed to be a vampire, a costume store throwaway that could be gotten a million different places for a few bucks. But it obviously didn't wind up here by itself, so what was the reason why? After a moment or two, I radioed my superiors. They told me to sit tight and they'd come check it out. They did, and they decided to just log the find in the record and told me and the others to keep an eye out for more of them. That's not surprising because most of the job is just keeping an eye out for anything odd. So I went on with the rest of my day and eventually... Like most things, it wound up being just a story. Everyone working there had their own, and this happened to be one of mine. 
A story that wouldn't continue until several weeks later. It was warm out, but with the sun setting, the air was getting just a bit cooler. As I headed back to the ranger station from where I had been double-checking something, I could see the sun peeking out from behind the trees. It wasn't quite dusk yet, but it wouldn't be long before it was time. The day had been one of those perfect spring days where it was warm, but not humid, and you can feel summer in the air. There was also some fog out, which is always interesting in the woods. But my favorite part of nighttime out here was that on clear nights, the moon would reflect off the lake's calm surface. The lake was surrounded by a quarry, so it wasn't easy to get to. I don't have much reason to go down by the lake, but when I do and the sun is setting, it's magnificent to see. Aside from a single wooden dock that's kept locked up, there's no way to access the lake. Not that you would want to go swimming in it. Because it's all rocky soil, it's a nightmare to walk on. And there's not much fish in it, so it's not much good for fishing either. But that view at sundown, sunset, or when the moon is full, beats any fishing or swimming, in my opinion. I've always loved lakes and ponds, and this one was no exception. I love hearing the croak of frogs and the hum of insects. Nothing says summer to me like hearing crickets and seeing the fireflies floating over the water while the smell of campfires and charcoal linger in the air. It wasn't warm enough for fireflies yet, but the lights stationed around the pavilions had drawn in the usual insects that were swarming around the light. I was just about to keep walking when I noticed something small sitting there on the dock. I couldn't quite make out what it was from this distance, so I got my binoculars from my truck and took a closer look. There was no doubt it was another mask. How did it get down there? The dock and the lake are both carefully monitored, so I had no idea. But I wasted no time radioing it in, and they agreed to send some more rangers my way. I spent the rest of the time keeping an eye out on the area, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever had been leaving the masks around. I stood there and watched as a team of rangers went to the dock, took a few Polaroid photos, and eventually put the mask in a bag to log the find. This one was noted with a bit more concern because it meant someone unauthorized got access to the lake. But just like last time, there wasn't much to be done besides make a note and keep an eye out for anything more significant. So I went home and had some dinner before I relaxed for the rest of the evening. Nothing significant happened for about a month after that. Summer and all the outside activities that come with it meant we were all kept busy. It was also possible that the increased crowds may have also temporarily scared off whoever was leaving the masks, lying around. But one evening after a hot day with a cloudless sky, I was patrolling the area in my truck. With the air conditioning blasting on high, I made my rounds to make sure nothing was going on. I had just finished one section of the park and was about to head to the one adjacent to it, when there, sitting by a pine tree, was another mask. My stomach lurched slightly as I realized it looked very similar to the first one I discovered. But it was different from the second one, which is exactly what I told the ranger station when I radioed the find in. And just like the other times, they logged it in and told me to keep an eye out for anything else. This had officially become odd, which everyone at the park agreed on. Halloween wasn't for another few months, so there wasn't a clear reason these masks were turning up. There wasn't a store that sold Halloween masks like this for miles, and none of them had any in stock. This was in 1986, so not only was this a time when people didn't advertise for holidays months in advance, you certainly couldn't jump on the internet and order Halloween stuff to be delivered to your house. So that meant whoever had done this had to have gone through special planning to just get these masks before they were deliberately brought here. I loved Halloween as much as anyone, but I was puzzled and unnerved by someone deliberately leaving these masks around. When my shift ended, I went home, threw some dinner into the microwave, then went to bed. The rain was pouring when I woke up the next morning. That wasn't a surprise, since the humidity had been stifling, and it was only a matter of time before we had a downpour. And this was certainly that. 
It thudded on the roof in a rhythm I've always found the calming, but it wouldn't last. Summer rainstorms never do. It rains intensely for a few minutes before it calms down and the sun comes out, so I had no problem relaxing for a while until the rain slowed down. Since today happened to be my day off, I went to see my friend Nick for some information. He'd lived in the area his whole life, and if anyone had an idea about what was going on with the masks, it would probably be him. Nick worked at the electronic store at the mall, so I headed there. He was perched behind the counter, casually watching people wander in and out when I arrived. Stuart, he greeted me with a smile. What's up? Not much, Nick. Just busy with work. Speaking of that, remember I told you about finding random Halloween masks in the park? What about it? I found another one last night. Very similar looking to the first one, but different from the second. Weird. Tell me about it. No one seems to have much of a clue, and since you've always lived around here, I thought if anyone could tell me why this seems to be happening, it would be you. I'm flattered, Stuart, but I don't know anything more than you do. He paused. But I do know one person who might be able to help. Nick grabbed a piece of paper and wrote something on it before handing it to me. This is the contact info for Eric Pierce, professor at the local college. Knows everything about local history. He's a good friend of my aunt's, so just mention that and you'll be good. Thanks, Nick. You're the best. I called the number and I was told that Eric Pierce was available for me to talk to tomorrow after I explained who I was and why I wanted to talk to him. Since I didn't have to work until late the following day, I headed over before my ship. Pierce's office was filled with books and papers. Even the elegant mahogany desk was covered with them. Eric Pierce himself was a tall man in his early fifties with gray hair neatly combed back, and he was dressed in a dark gray suit coat, white dress shirt, and slacks. Hello, Stuart, he shook my hand. I think I have information that may be of interest to you and your colleagues. I sat down in one of the comfortable armchairs facing the desk. Excellent. When did these masks start appearing? Late this spring, and never before. Never. He nodded. I suspected as much. Then he grabbed a folder on his desk and pushed it towards me. I opened it and saw it contained several newspaper clippings about a man named James Findlay. They were relatively recent and explained that Findlay was a local criminal who'd gone missing in the woods adjacent to the park where I worked. I was about to ask Pierce a question before the answer was right there in the article. Finley was often known to wear Halloween masks while robbing stores. This is starting to make more sense, I said. Pierce nodded. I thought it might, but it doesn't explain everything. Pierce responded by pushing another file towards me. When I opened it, I saw three missing persons flyers. All three were men in their late twenties, early thirties from neighboring states who'd gone missing within the last several months. It's not official, but I've heard local talk from people who'd seen them that the three men were looking for treasure they thought Findlay had hidden in the woods close to where you work, or maybe actually in the park you work. No kidding, indeed. So what do you think happened? Pierce leaned back in his chair. No one knows what exactly happened Finley. Maybe he fled somewhere and is living under a new name. Maybe he's right under our noses. Maybe he messed with the wrong person. Maybe something happened to him out in the woods. Or maybe it's a combination of things. But I can say this. People like Finley just don't stop voluntarily. And since there's been no word of him doing something similar elsewhere, I think it's reasonable to suspect something happened. I nodded. That made sense to me. Were the masks just found laying around in random places, he asked. Yes, he sat there quietly for a moment. When you go looking for treasure, two things can happen. You find nothing, or you find something. And if you find something, it might not be what you wanted. I've found nothing to believe there was even the chance Findlay, or even someone remotely like Findlay, ever buried treasure out in the woods anywhere near here. Or anywhere else, for that matter. So why would they come here? 
Tierce looked at me, and in that moment I saw him look more than a little unnerved. I think they were lured out there, and I don't need to tell you. People who try to lure people out to the woods by telling them a story typically aren't up to anything good. A chill shot through my body at this. He had a point. I think you may be on to something. Just a theory. But that's all we have right now. Let me know if there's anything else I can do for you. I really appreciate it, Professor Pierce. Anytime, he pushed the two folders towards me. Take this with you for your colleagues. It may help. It may. Thank you again. I left his office and went to work. Once I was there, I told everyone what I found and what Professor Pierce's theory was. They all sat there in silence before agreeing it was just a theory, but beyond plausible. So it was decided to patrol the place more thoroughly in addition to other steps to increase security and keep out people who may be up to something. We involved local people with close ties to the area and had them alert either park personnel or the police if they thought they saw something funny going on. It worked because none of us ever found any more masks. The three men who disappeared were never found, just like James Findlay, and we never figured out how someone got access to the lake. A search team was sent in, but they didn't find anything in the lake itself. The last thing I ever heard about the matter was that a car that was registered to one of the men who disappeared was found abandoned in a field about two hours away from here. Nothing was wrong, and there was no sign of a struggle. How it got there is anyone's guess, but Paula, one of the rangers I worked with, is certain she saw that car in the area right before the masks started showing up. Paula didn't get a good look at the driver, but she swears it wasn't who it was registered to, or any of the other men who disappeared. The creepiest part is that they never did find out who that guy was or what he was up to, but witnesses were able to confirm he had been to the local hardware store and bought a bunch of chains and rope. I'm Roxanne, 41 years old and currently living in Napa County. I want to share a story from 1962 when I was just six years old, living in San Francisco with my mother and my nine-year-old sister, Denise. We were playing in our backyard, which was part of a big old Dutch colonial house, a two-story beauty in San Francisco. My mother hailed from England and had that lovely English accent. My sister and I were in the backyard, and I had a favorite tree I loved to climb. There was a perfect groove where I would sit and lose myself in my thoughts, sometimes even talking to my tree, which I'd affectionately named. So there I was, up in my tree, swinging from its branches, while my sister, the lady of the family, picked flowers. I lost track of her activities as I was engrossed in my tree, climbing adventure. Our mother's voice came faintly from the patio, calling out, Roxanne, Denise, dinner time. Our house was enormous, and it was challenging to hear her from the backyard. I could barely make out her call, so I decided to rush for the back door, shouting, I'll get Dennis. I ran back to find Denise to let her know it was almost dinner time, but she was nowhere in the backyard. I figured she might be up to something mischievous, even though we weren't supposed to venture beyond the fence, as there was an empty lot next door. Our house was at a kind of kitty corner, with the neighboring house next door and an empty lot filled with grass beside it. As I hopped up onto the fence, balancing on a two-by-four and straining to see over, I scanned the empty lot, wondering where Denise had gone. What I witnessed next horrified me. There she was, lying down, and two men were with her. One of the men knelt while my sister's head hung limply in his lap. She seemed unconscious, unresponsive. The other man was bent over her with a syringe, poised to inject her. I stood there in stunned silence, initially unable to believe my eyes, especially because of how strangely they were dressed. These men weren't wearing black jackets. They had on black capes and Zorro-style hats. It wasn't until I grew older that I realized the resemblance to Zorro. 
As a man prepared to give her the injection, I screamed my sister's name as loudly as I could. Panicking, I yelled, leave my sister alone, and broke into tears. In my fright, I slipped off the bench, getting a million splinters in my palm, which I hardly felt at the time. I bolted towards the house to get my mother, but I stumbled and fell into the brick flower bed we had. My instinct screamed at me to save my sister. There was no time to fetch my mother. I hopped back onto the fence, a height I had never managed before. But to my bewilderment, the man vanished. Denise was waking up, and I asked her what had happened, who those men were, and why they were doing this to her. I was freaking out, being only six years old. Her response was confusing. She seemed unaware of the incident. She asked me what was wrong, why I looked so scared, and why I was so pale. I tried to explain what had transpired, but she dismissed it, saying, Oh, brother. She even offered to come over the fence with me, still groggy and looking like she had just woken up. I went back into the house and decided not to tell my mother, as I was sure it would terrify her. Instead, I confided in my father. In 1993, my friends and I were heading out to a local bar one night. There were four of us in the car, cruising down a road surrounded by dense woods. As we drove, something caught our attention. What we initially believed to be a helicopter flashing its lights on the ground. We assumed it was involved in some police operation, perhaps searching for a suspect who had broken into a house or a potential drug dealer. We found ourselves stopped at a traffic light just sitting in the car, watching this lengthy beam of light. We speculated that the police must have caught someone, as the light abruptly stopped at one point and then continued on, tracing through various lights further down the road. We thought they might try to stop us from getting to our destination. Then the light suddenly stopped and pointed down at the ground. We all agreed. They got him. The light switched off, and the next thing we knew... We were at another traffic light, still observing this so-called police helicopter. Well, we thought it was a police helicopter at the time, although most of us are skeptical now. It couldn't have been one because when it decided to leave, it vanished in an instant. It was gone within ten seconds flat, and we couldn't even keep track of it. When we finally reached the club we were headed to, we had only been inside for about twenty minutes, when a friend tapped me on the shoulder and said, Look, we all turned to see four men walking in, dressed in black suits. Now, this was unusual because we hadn't started drinking yet, and it was odd to see four guys in black suits entering a nightclub. What made it even weirder was that they were wearing sunglasses, and you just don't walk into a club with sunglasses on at night, right? It's usually for safety to avoid tripping over things or injuring yourself. However, they complied when the bouncer asked them to remove their sunglasses. As they took off their shades, we noticed their eyes. They were kind of dark, with a peculiar grayish hue, and it felt like their eyes were watching our every move. They maintained their distance, consistently standing about ten or five feet away from us as we moved around the bar. About those eyes, I would describe them as having a strange grayish color with black in the cataract part and a light gray or blue-gray tone. These four guys were all about the same height, dressed the same, and they even had those eerie identical eyes. In 1995, something incredibly strange happened to me, although the man involved never gave me his name. It all started one night after I'd finished work. I found myself stopped at a red traffic light, and then, the next thing I knew, I was 20 miles away, and an hour had passed. At that time, I had no knowledge of missing time or anything of the sort, so I simply brushed it off as some bizarre occurrence and didn't think much of it. About a week later, I was out and had pulled into a gas station to refuel. Once again, it was nighttime. I recall a very tall man, impeccably dressed in a black suit, approaching me. He told me that I was going to give him a ride. 
Naturally, I hesitated and said, No, why don't you ask someone else for a ride? But he was insistent and declared, No, you're going to give me a ride. In a rush of anxiety, I capped the gas tank and hurried around to the driver's side of my car. I thought the passenger side was locked, but when I got into the car, I discovered he had somehow entered the car already. He forcibly pulled me in and threatened to kill me if I kept screaming. He made it clear he only wanted me to drive him around. He kept repeating, Nothing has happened to you. You won't remember anything. Nothing happened to you. As I drove, I came to a stop sign, and he looked at me and said, I know what you're trying to do, and if the police pull us over, I will immediately kill you. The constant refrain was, nothing happened to you. Nothing happened to you. You'll never tell anybody that anything happened. We eventually ended up in the middle of nowhere, and I was still trembling with fear. He got out of the car, and when I looked at him, it was as if his eyes weren't there. He simply said, Leave now because I don't want to hurt you. I wasted no time in driving away, and as I did, I began to cry uncontrollably. After escaping from that horrifying encounter, I returned to town and drove around until I found a police officer. They told me that the police had already been looking for me because the clerk at the liquor store had seen the man get into my car and heard me scream. They were searching for me my car and a man in a black suit who had climbed into my car. However, they never found him, and he disappeared without a trace. Since then, I've had several incidents that have left me too terrified to drive at night anymore. On those occasions, a black car would pull up behind me, flashing its lights, seemingly trying to get me to pull over. My only thought was to get home as quickly as possible, and I've avoided driving at night ever since. I have not thought of this in a while, but recently saw a show talking about the Mothman that triggered my memory of an encounter I had in 2016. It was late September in Chester, West Virginia, Hancock County, early in the morning, but daylight. As I walked across town, I approached one of the churches in the center of town. This church has a huge cross on the top of the roof. I noticed something big and black on top of that cross. As I got closer, I could not keep my eyes off of it as I was trying to see what it was. My curiosity was piqued as I reached the church and could get the best view. This thing was at least five feet tall, all black, and crouched down the horizontal beam of the cross. It looked almost like a bird, but huge. I was more curious than I was scared and wanted to get a better view or see what it would do. So I began to shout out to it. Just as it turned, its head looked down at me, and then, whoosh, it took flight. I could then see that it did indeed have wings that must have had a very wide total span as it flew off into the direction of the bridge across town where I could no longer see it. I was amazed. My heart was pounding as I thought to myself, was that a mothman? I wish I had captured a picture or video for proof, but in the moment I honestly was just so in awe I didn't even think of it until later. But I have read similar reports of sightings all throughout the Ohio Valley. From Ohio to Pennsylvania and down to Kentucky, I just wanted to put this out there so that someone else like me doesn't think they are crazy and that I've seen it too. This occurred during the Christmas break of 2012. My friends and I were out for a late-night cruise catching up after being away at college. We were headed to one of our favorite places to visit, Screaming Tunnel, just inside the city limits of Niagara Falls, Ontario. We were at the intersection of Warner Road and Garner Road when we saw in the yard of the property across from us a large creature hunched over on all fours. There was a fair amount of snow on the ground, so we could only make out the outline of the creature, but it was massive, much larger than coyotes, deer, or anything you usually encounter in the area. The other thing that struck me was the eyes. 
Even though this creature was mostly shrouded in shadow, you could see the bright yellow eyes. It gave me a very eerie feeling. We continued down the road, and when we arrived, we got out to look around, as usual. We felt very uneasy, like we were being watched, and even though they never said anything, I could tell by the looks on my friends' faces that they were feeling the same thing I was, and that we needed to get the hell out of there fast. We piled in the car and took off at a good clip, the eerie sense that we were being watched, followed us all the way down Warner, until we turned back onto the main road, Taylor Rod. That was the first and only time I could say I felt like my life was in imminent danger. Even to this day, when I go back, I keep a very close eye on my surroundings. Ontario, Canada. The most terrifying night I have ever experienced was when my mother, Ian Law, bought me a night vision scope for Christmas. We had a lot of deer that would come through the backyard. I shut off all of the lights in the house and opened up the back door, hoping to see a deer. What I saw was a full-blown skeleton in detail about ten yards away. I could see every little detail, ribs, eye sockets, teeth, and everything. The skeleton was noticed me, and it slowly turned its head and made eye contact with me. It transformed into a ball of energy and bounced away. I immediately walked to exactly where it was standing, and it was looking through the French doors to my bedroom as my wife was laying in bed. I lost my shit after that. I'm telling you, every bit of this is true. Cheers! I am now 30, three years old, but would like to submit in regards to some events that occurred when I was 14 years old, starting on the day before Thanksgiving, November 24, 2004, in Lesport, Pennsylvania. I have decided to go public about the terrifying things that have happened. It was a strange day on November 24, 2004. I caught a glimpse of a TV show talking about a man who can practically summon UFOs. I was skeptical even at a young age, but thought that since it was my own voice inside of my own head, it would save me the embarrassment if I gave it a try. I basically asked to meet the pilots of these strange craft and learn about the vehicles and how they work. A couple of hours later, I was shocked to see a report on a separate channel, a news channel that there was a UFO spotted over Reading, Pennsylvania, only minutes from where we lived at the time. A few hours later in the middle of the night, I had been awakened, terrified by two alien beings, commonly referred to as the Gray standing in front of me, staring at me at my bedside. I don't know how they did it, but they had woken me up telepathically somehow. I clearly remember the red capital letters wake up flashing before my closed eyelids in an alarm, like buzzing inside of my head in an intense vibration. It woke me up immediately, and when I saw them in front of me, one that was closer to me was much taller than the other. I immediately panicked, throwing the blankets over myself and trying to calm my respiration and heart rate. I waited and waited for them to leave. It was sheer terror in the scariest night of my life. I heard feet rustling on the carpet, and as daylight began to break, I took a cautious peek to see that they had left. A few nights later, I had an urge to watch television on a late school night. My stepmom used to hide the remote in an office drawer in the kitchen. I'm not sure what had caused the urge to watch TV at such an odd hour. I suppose I was still shaken from a few nights prior. I had come to notice that the remote was nowhere to be found in the drawer, so I had looked around the countertop, turned around, and skimmed the countertop of the kitchen island, only to see the same creature from nights before standing outside of the kitchen window, staring at me. Startled, I must have jumped three feet in the air and ran out of the kitchen and up the steps to my bedroom. 
That same night, I had a strange and vivid nightmare of my blankets being lifted into the air and being dragged out of my bed by the ankles by the hands of two shorter grays, then being returned to my bed and watching them leave through a strange pink portal in the wall. I have not had any further encounters. I was in the ninth grade when this incident occurred. Usually, after our school ended, I used to go to tuition with my two friends. Our tuition class was situated in a small jungle area, and we would arrive at the class exactly at 6 p.m. It was a haunted place, as some people had experienced really creepy incidents there. Even our teacher had warned us that it was dangerous, and she herself had an unusual experience there. With only two street lights due to its remoteness, it used to be too dark when we had to get back home. Despite the ominous reputation, we hadn't experienced anything unusual there because my friends and I used to have fun playing and talking. One day, however, something unsettling happened. A junior friend of mine urgently needed to use the washroom, so he went outside the class compound to pee, as we usually did. While peeing, he turned his face to the right where there was a small, empty house with broken windows, making everything inside visible in the complete darkness. As he turned, he saw the figure of an adult-sized child with a creepy face. Only the head and a hand were visible, and the figure was gesturing and calling my friend. Terrified, he came running to our teacher and shared everything that had happened with him. He didn't come to class for two days, as he had a fever due to the traumatic incident. My bestie and I, being teenagers at the time, dismissed his experience as a hallucination. Curious. We decided to tour the haunted house with another friend recording the whole thing on his phone. It was around 8 p.m. and we roamed around the house, recording everything from the outside, making lighthearted comments like, Hey ghost, where are you? We are here to see you. As we reached the back of the house, I felt a flash while looking at the camera, but I ignored it. From the back, we could see our remaining friends standing outside the class compound. Towards the end of the tour, we called our friends from behind the house, assuring them that there was nothing there, and we even whistled as we concluded the video recording. When we returned to the class and were ready to watch the video, we realized the footage lasted only two minutes despite our tour lasting around eight to nine minutes. We both remembered checking the video recording twice before starting so there was no doubt about whether we had initiated the recording. To this day, we talk about that eerie experience, and we can't shake the feeling that something inexplicable was truly there. I don't have any horrible stories since I avoid situations that set me on edge. However... One experience or situation did come to me recently. I live in MS, which is home to a majority of the Natchez Trace. The Trace is a 440-mile-long highway between Nashville and Natchez that runs parallel to a Native American trade route used by southeastern Native American tribes. During the 1700s and 1800s, it was one of the most influential and dangerous trade routes in the southeast due to its connection with the eastern states and the Miamis River. Now it's a protected state park or roadway system. Think Appalachian Trail. It's not a preferred route for travel since it's two lanes with speeds only up to 55 miles per hour, and there has been the occasional crime occur due to its remoteness and lack of authorities. But it's really pretty lands when you're driving for the heck of it. Twenty-five years ago, we lived in North M.S., but the rest of our family lived in South M.S. It just so happened that a small time of the trip went along the trace. My mom did a lot of these trips by herself with three kids, only five years between oldest to youngest. Most of the drive feels normal and safe. However, there's one area that made nervous at 10 and makes me nervous at 30. It's called Witch Dance. Witch Dance is a walking or biking trail around 230 miles from Natchez. 
The legend says that there are patches of burnt or brown earth that will never grow in that area due to witches dancing in the trees. It's probably a made-up story, but there are random patches of brown grass no matter the season. It never grows. In 26 years since I first drove past the stop, I still get a cold feeling down my back when I imagine turning back to the trees there. It just never has sat right with me. I don't like it. It was a chilly autumn morning in northwest Oregon, in the dense mist that often blanketed the landscape, lent an eerie atmosphere to the surroundings. I was sitting with my friend, Mark, on the porch of his childhood home, sipping coffee and reminiscing about the peculiar incident that had left an indelible mark on his childhood. Mark began the tale with a nostalgic smile, his eyes reflecting the innocence of the eight-year-old boy he once was. The incident unfolded on their sprawling property a vast expanse of land atop a hill that overlooked the scenic beauty of Oregon. His mom had just left for work, the front door closing with a soft click behind her, leaving Mark alone in the house. As any curious and adventurous child would, Mark decided to explore the expansive hillside property. The thick fog clung to the trees, creating an almost mystical atmosphere. He scampered up the hill, his small sneakers crunching the fallen leaves beneath. The world seemed to shrink around him as he ascended to the top, where the hill plateaued into a vast playground of nature. Engulfed in his playful reverie, Mark suddenly heard a voice, distant yet familiar, calling out to him, Mark, sweetie, come here! The voice, tender and maternal, echoed through the crisp morning air. Confusion etched across his face as he turned towards the sound. It couldn't be his mom. She had just left for work a few minutes ago. As he stood there, a perplexed eight-year-old on the precipice of the hill, the voice persisted. Mark, come on, honey. This time the call seemed to carry an urgency that sent a shiver down his spine. His innocent eyes scanned the surroundings, seeing the source of this mysterious beckoning. He hesitated, unsure of whether to respond. The voice continued to echo, seemingly originating from the dense fog that enveloped the hill. A mix of curiosity and trepidation gnawed at him. What if it was someone in need? What if it was his mom, despite the logical impossibility? As Mark cautiously approached the edge of the property, the mist thickened, creating an ethereal barrier between him and the unseen caller. He strained his eyes, attempting to pierce through the fog. The voice now laced with an otherworldly quality persisted, weaving a delicate web of uncertainty around him. A sense of foreboding crept over him, and he halted in his tracks. The realization struck him like a sudden gust of wind. This wasn't right. With a mix of fear and instinct, he retraced his steps, the fog swallowing the haunting voice as he descended the hill. Reaching the safety of his home, Mark peered back at the misty hilltop, the mysterious voice now lost in the cold morning air. The incident remained etched in his memory, a cryptic puzzle that time could not erase. To this day, he couldn't shake the feeling that something inexplicable had called out to him that fog-laden morning atop the hill of his childhood home in northwest Oregon. I was once camping with the Boy Scouts, as you do when you're 16. My friends and I went off the beaten path at around 9 at night, miles from camp and anyone else. We were kind of rule breakers, so no one knew where we were or what we were doing. Anyway, we were walking with our one flashlight between the four of us, and my friend holding it goes, Did y'all hear that? He shines the light behind us, but there's nothing there. This repeats as we keep hearing something, like twigs and leaves crunching. We stop one last time. It's dead quiet. Suddenly on all sides of us there's howling. I'm talking the gray, wolfman howling in every direction. 
in front, behind, all sides. With one flashlight, we follow the person in front sprinting through the woods like our lives depended on it. It was terrifying. I was on a deployment in the Navy back in 2008, and part of my job was to stand on top of the boat and look for other boats. Boring as shit. So at night, naturally, I spent a healthy amount of time either masturbating or looking at the stars. One of these nights at around 2, mind you. At 2 a.m. in the middle of the ocean, it's dark, and I mean real dark. I was staring at some portion of the night sky, transfixed on a few stars, when... One of said stars moved. I can't be sure if it was moving before it caught my eye, but if I had to answer, I'd say it was stationary before it shot in one direction. Any other time, I would have wrote it off as a shooting star. Most nights I would see seven, but this one changed its direction. So much so that it was unnatural, almost at a 90-degree angle. I'm no astrologer, but that shit doesn't happen. I was dumbstruck for a second, and after a few moments, I called it up to the bridge. I reported it as the unidentified flying object bearing some degree from the ship. Now, if it was any other officer on the bridge got this report, I'd probably be in trouble. But this one knew me on a personal level and came out to talk to me to sift through my bullshit. After giving a pretty convincing story with a I'm serious bro attitude... He went back to the bridge and got me the longitude and latitude and where we were, and I think I still have that to this day. I can tell you off the top of my head that it was it the Red Sea, and I honestly believe it was some form of life beyond us. Okay, so the house was built in 1892 and serves as a bed and breakfast. The owners are friends of my mother. It was a private residence for several decades, then a hospital for 50 years. Then a private residence again, and now it's a B&B. &B. It has five stories plus a basement and was built in a late Victorian style. I helped them move furniture a while back, and nothing major happened, but I was with the owners of the house at the time except for lights not working that normally worked, which could have been electrical issues due to the old house. However, there were certain rooms where I could definitely sense a presence and moments when I was the only physical body, yet I didn't feel alone. Not necessarily a malevolent presence, but a presence for sure. The owners of the house either don't believe in paranormal activity or don't want to believe in it. The husband doesn't, and I'm not sure about the wife. I'll be their dog sitting for three days and three nights. Please share any insight or advice you might possess. I'm not into paranormal stuff, and I don't go seeking it out, which is why I'm hesitant to say yes. Still, they have been good to me, especially my mom, so I don't want to say no. One, one. I was with two of my friends that night when it happened. I was driving them home because I was the only one who didn't drink at the party we attended early in the evening. We were on the road when my friend Alex felt sick, so I decided to park the car a few minutes on the side road and wait for him to get better. I remember it was a clear night because of the full moon high in the sky. The landscape was beautiful. The beach was close to the road, and I could perfectly see it. To the dark gray sand, the bright sea, and the big boulder in the middle, not far from the shore. But something strange was on it, so I got closer. At first I was startled, because who in their right mind could sleep on a boulder, half immersed in the cold water of winter, at three in the morning? That's where things got weird. The thing looked like a woman at first, but instead of legs, she had a strong tail covered in scales with what it looked like a scarf fin on top of her back. Her skin was gray, but with the night, so everything else around me. She seemed to sleep with her head resting on her forearms. 
In the panic, I shouted to my other friend, Myra, to put the headlight of the car on, because I wanted to see it better, and when I looked in front of me again, so was the thing. God, I could never forget it. She was staring at me, her bottom half lying on the boulder while she was standing on her webbed hands, who ended up with big claws. Her hair was moving with the wind, but they were weird, like snakes. But it wasn't really snakes. I don't know how to describe it. She had two big white eyes, with no pupils at all, or eyebrows, and instead of a nose, she had six slits in both sides of her face, and her mouth was very small thin and with no lips. I was so frightened by her eyes staring at me I couldn't move a single bone in my body. Then I hear my friends run to me, and before they arrived she turned on her tail and disappeared into the sea with a loud splash and waves all around, and just like that she was gone. All this happened in seconds, but it was eternity for me. My friends didn't see anything, and I was too shocked to tell them. To this day, they still don't know what happened to me, and I didn't tell anybody either. Nobody would have believed me, and I can't blame them. If this would have happened to somebody else, I would never have believed them either. And frankly, I didn't want to be called crazy. Sometimes I wonder if indeed I'm not crazy. But then one day, several months after that night, I saw on TV that a diver was scared to death on the same area. Doctors said that he must have seen something really scary. I don't think it's a coincidence. Now, I know that I saw a real mermaid, and it was not the pretty mermaid Hollywood want us to believe. I don't know if she was good or not. I was just so scared. Humans are scared of the unknown, and this proved to be true. Since then, I'm scared of swimming. I live on an island, so, of course, there is the sea all around, but I don't go in there. I'm still scared, and I don't want to see her ever again. I never return to that beach because I know what's in there, and you would be scared to death, too, if you ever meet that thing in the water. My buddy and I heard of phantom headlights and cars that would suddenly appear then not be there the moment you look again. We were driving on a straight part of the road, level ground, about to come up on one of the first main hills, past all the telephone poles and lights, pitch black, when we saw something start to glow in the horizon. It was raining, so if it was a car with its high beams, it would definitely illuminate the sky. But as we drove up the first hill, we noticed that it was only one singular light, and it was so bright that it literally could have been the sunset if it wasn't 12 a.m. Anyways, it's midnight, raining on a random road in the middle of Suskin, so the idea that maybe it was just a motorcycle was out of question, because who would drive a motorcycle that late, randomly, in the rain? Then we noticed just how bright it actually was and how there was something else that was odd. It wasn't moving. It didn't get closer to us. And it almost appeared to be in the middle of the road. So within a full, maybe 30, 45 seconds of seeing this thing, it didn't move, get brighter, get bigger, even though we are flooring it down the road to get a glimpse of it. Then while we are still on the hill climbing up towards it, poof, the light just turns off. But it wasn't instant. It was like turning off a fluorescent light bulb or dimming a lamp. It made the hair on our back stand up because, as far as we knew, we just experienced one of these phantom headlights that there are stories of. But get this, as we drove for another, say, 30 seconds after the light went out, we got to where the light was shining from, and a very shitty sedan drove past us with headlights that in no way could have been what we saw. I'm mentioning the car so I don't rule out the idea that maybe it was the car to keep my own sanity. But I don't know, dude. From how it acted to the timing and our speed or location, I don't think the car made that light. Thanks for all the upvotes. Let me know if you have seen any weird phenomenon like me. New edit just for updates. My friend and I, plus some new friends who I got into Suskin stories, 
are really passionate about literally anything dedicated to haunted things happening up there. Once again, if anybody has any stories or just to tell new people to go for a drive and maybe record, it'd be cool to get more info about this insane 18 mile long haunted road. Really appreciate all the comments and debates about what people believe is real or their own short stories. Thanks. Late one night, my wife and I decided to go on a moonlit walk on our property to find good spots to look up at the stars because we were considering getting a telescope. We got into the car and drove to the very end of our driveway, which is approximately a quarter of a mile from the main road with thick woods on both sides. As we started walking up the driveway about halfway up, we felt like we were being watched. We stopped, and then we started hearing very loud noises in the woods to our left. It sounded like something was running towards us. Shocked and panicked, my wife turned and started running back towards the vehicle. Reba, my wife, said, I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. I told my husband to come on, and he told me to go ahead. So I ran back to the car as fast as I could, got in, and locked the doors. Jason, the husband, continued the story. After my wife ran back to the vehicle, I immediately got a flashlight out of my pocket to scan the woods. I did not feel comfortable turning my back on whatever this was. I smelled a foul odor in the air. It's hard to describe, but it was an overwhelming, nauseating odor, like a mixture of roadkill and wet dog with a faint scent of sulfur. The sulfur smell was akin to the odor. After striking a match and blowing it out, but more potent, my heart was racing, my palms were sweaty, and my senses were heightened. My body went into a state of alert from fear, which is not normal for me. I grew up my whole life hunting, entering the woods well before daylight and exiting well after sundown. I'm familiar with local wildlife like deer, bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, panthers, and wild hogs, so I'm not easily scared. However, this animal kept charging at me a little bit at a time, then stopping and charging again. It was so loud that it sounded like a bull elephant coming through the woods at me. This was when I knew it was something I had never heard before. I never got a glimpse of the creature, and I didn't see any eye shine. I searched high and low, scanning the woods. The animal had to be far enough into the woods that I could not see it, but it sounded like it was right next to me at the edge of the woods. At this point, I slowly backed up the hill, never turning around and always keeping the flashlight scanning the woods. I didn't know what to expect. I built up enough courage to shout, that's enough, just stay back, in a stern, loud voice. I doubted the creature understood anything I said, but I hoped the tone would be enough to make it stop coming towards me. Shortly after I shouted, everything began to calm and I think it understood that we were leaving the area. After feeling that I was being watched and pushed out of the area, I finally reached the top of the hill and felt it was safe to turn around, so I ran the rest of the way to the car. My wife had the doors locked, so I flashed my lights and tapped on the window. She immediately unlocked the doors, and I got in. Then she immediately locked the doors back, and we drove back up to the house. This was the first of many occurrences that happened on that property. It seemed that after this encounter, the activity picked up in the following months. I have heard many stories at Deer Camp about people seeing this creature, but I always dismissed it as folklore. However, this experience made me realize that there is really something out there. It sparked my desire to look into it further and do some of my own research, because I felt as if I were losing it. As I replayed the events in my head, I tried to make sense of it all, but the research I have done seems to bring me more questions than answers. My family recently moved into a new rental home. My family consists of me, my mom and her partner, and my child and two dogs. 
The dogs act weird at night occasionally by growling or barking like they hear someone outside. A few nights ago, my mom was having a hard time sleeping and kept waking up, and twice she saw me standing next to her bed, looking at her. She didn't say anything because it's a common thing I do as she has sleep apnea and wears a CPAP and I sometimes fix it on her face or make sure she's breathing and, and then go back to bed. But I was sound asleep. Last night she was almost asleep and by the night light, light saw something dark lean close to her face quickly, then vanished. Tonight, while my child was in the kitchen and I was in my room and mom and partner were sleeping, my child heard me from the hallway saying, Hey! Hey! in a really monotone voice. From my room, I thought I heard my mom talking. But when he came in and asked if I had been in the hall, I went to check and everyone else was asleep. What do I do? Hello, folks. I had some interesting experiences in my youth, and people around me told me a few things. I would like to briefly report on them here and share my ideas. Of course, I'm also interested in yours because a lot of things don't fit together. A bit of information first. I'm German, 40-plus, male, atheist, and everything I'm describing allegedly took place in a small town until the early 2000s. It's right on the border with the former East Germany. Now grab a drink, stay a while, and listen. A man from the neighborhood told that a small object landed in his garden. A few beings got out and took soil samples. The people he confided in told him to shut the foot up or they would come and get him. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out any more information except that this was in the late 60s, early 70s. All those involved are now deceased. I think they meant the nice people from the asylum. Strange lights were apparently normal in my parents' teenage years. They called dates looking at UFOs. As I said, our village was right on the border with the Eastern Bloc. It's not that unusual for someone to be interested in monitoring the border, whoever it was. My father saw a shining white woman in the stairwell of our apartment in the evening. He wanted to show her to my older brother, who was still small at the time, but he couldn't see her. This probably happened in the 80s. There are thousands of reports about these women in white, enough to fill several stadiums with the ladies. There are just as many interpretations of what these appearances mean, so I can't really speculate. It is remarkable that only my father saw the woman. It could be that only he should or could see her, or he was drunk. I can no longer ask him about this because he died of cancer in 2001. 1998. My brother and I were driving to my grandparents' house where he lived. From a distance, we saw what we thought was a helicopter hovering over the cemetery in our village. This is close to our destination. As we drove past it, we realized that it was one of those huge triangular UFOs that were often reported in the press in Europe in the 90s. We just drove past it without paying much attention. When we got to our grandparents' house, we got out of the car, and of course it was gone. I've written about this before in another thread. Even though the Belgian UFO wave was often reported in the early 90s, these things were also seen all over Europe before and after that. This was my only close encounter. I had seen one of these objects twice before, but this time it was close enough to throw a stone at it. But of course we didn't. The most interesting thing here was not so much our lack of interest, that's another topic, but rather that this huge object, although it stood directly above the trees and had huge lights down in its corners, did not illuminate the ground. How does that work? Was it amazing technology that utilizes features of reality that we can't even guess at? Was it some kind of hologram, a projection into space or our minds? Secret American airplanes? Or are we just crazy? 99 or 2000. My father had been suffering from chest pains for days. He dreamed that at night as he lay in bed. 
A gray alien entered the bedroom and placed its hand on his chest. He felt better for a while after that. Maybe that's what happened, but it's also possible that he suffered more than he wanted to admit to my mother and us three children. It may have been the subconscious desire for help that triggered this visit or this dream. A year later, my mother saw my father's deceased grandparents standing by his bed at night. They cried and said they had tried, but could no longer do anything for him. He was later diagnosed with cancer and died in early 2001. Again, it may be that this was a reality, but there is also the possibility that father told her about his dream and this was part of her version of the dream. Of course, she knew more about his suffering than we children, who are more concerned with ourselves. Then there were a few smaller things that I can't say much about. My brother felt his cat on his bed at night. Then it became clear to him that she should be in our grandparents' house. Or a mysterious ball of light that flew through the bedroom. My mother said when she left our parents' house and moved to another city that whatever she would do was to stay there. Well, that's all for now. Nothing special has actually happened since then, which I think is a shame. As I said, it all seems a bit thrown together and doesn't fit together well. But from all of this, I conclude that such things happen much more often than you think, and are that many people ignore them, keep quiet about them, explain them away, or dismiss them as unimportant. What has all of this done to me? and my life and my view of the world. Actually nothing. My family has always been open to everything and doesn't reject anything just because it can't be explained or is difficult to explain at the moment. There are a lot of things that are difficult to explain and understand. Black holes, how the theory of relativity and quantum theory fit together, exactly how painkillers work, my toddler's thoughts. Maybe we better apes are just not able to see things as they are. What do you think about it? And thank you for your attention. A while back, my husband and I wanted to check out a park that we had never been to before. It's on the outskirts of a smaller town, just a small forested park with a few walking trails and a parking lot for about 20 cars or so. We get out of the car and walked over to the information board, while a man in the only other occupied car in the lot started shouting random nonsense at us. There were only four total cars in the lot, so there were not a lot of other people around. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was creepy F. He kept shouting religious questions and random nonsense, so we didn't feel safe going on the trails into the woods. Instead, we got back into the car and drove to another park on the opposite side of town, at least ten miles away, and not a straightforward route between the two places. We go and have a nice hike, come back to the car about thirty minutes later, and guess who slowly drives past us? Yep, creepy guy from the first park. We could not imagine that he just happened to follow the same route and end up at this same other park as us by random coincidence. But the thing is, I watched to make sure he didn't follow us. He did not follow us out of the first park, and in, at no point was he behind us while driving. How did he find us? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.